Hello, well today I want to talk to you about re-spectrum, which is a very important case for us to consider when we're thinking about fixed and floating charges and how those types of charges might operate within an insolvency environment. And to give the case and its proper name, it's National Westminster Bank and Spectrum Plus Limited, 2005 square brackets. And the citation continues, two appeal cases at page 680. So we know then that this is a ultimately a House of Lords decision, and a very important House of Lords decision at that. Why? Well, because it changed did the judgments, or opinions I should say in the case, the way in which we view fixed and floating charges. And in particular, it changed a long-held practice that had been extant since the judgment of Mr Justice Slade in Sieber Gorman in the late 70s, which allowed a fixed charge to exist over the book debts of a company. So why did things change by the time that we get to 2005? Why is commercial certainty that had been extant for such a long period of time, why is that disrupted by, for example, Lord Walker and his judgment in Respectrum? Well, it's because of this. Briefly stated, the facts are this. You had National Westminster Bank who lent money to Spectrum, uh, it, it indeed provided some overdraft facilities for Spectrum uh, and that that exposure was protected in the sense that the bank was protected by a charge over the book debts that would come into Spectrum's account so that as money that was owed to Spectrum came into their accounts this charge would be in existence and would be able to protect the charge holder. The problem for the bank is that there was no monitoring of the way in which those accounts were undertaken in a close sense such as to be able to define their activity as that which would attach to a fixed charge. So they weren't, there wasn't, it wasn't a blocked account, it was one that could be freely used by Spectrum. In that sense then we might say that the value that was going in and out of the account fluctuated and therefore was something that perhaps might be more akin to our conceptions of a floating charge some kind of security device that only attaches on some insolvency event but in the interim allows those goods or that value in this account to move in and out without monitoring by the secured creditor and of course that was the problem uh, and indeed of course the House of Laws in due course say that the charge as expressed in the debenture instrument was in its nature a floating charge perhaps because of that lack of control that I've just described. This is incredibly important when we consider the insolvency waterfall because if the charge was a fixed charge it would be at the top of our waterfall of distribution so we have fixed charges preferential creditors floating charges and unsecured creditors so in our battle for value trying to knock out different elements of these ranking of of creditors if we are a fixed charge holder we're sitting pretty aren't we at the top of the waterfall if in some way our instrument is destroyed in terms of its effect or at least changed to be in its nature a floating charge we see we dip below the preferential creditors and in dipping of course it means that the value that might be extant in the company is then available for them the preferential creditors and the us as that floating charge holder now recategorized in this instance national westminster bank we're going to be a bit grumpy because we've just seen our ability to participate drop by a place and a place that of course is one that comes below the preferentials so when lord walker and his brethren held 
that this was by its nature a floating charge. They did recategorise its status, which was problematic for National Westminster, uh, National Westminster Bank, because of course we see that that freedom that was permitted on the account meant that what we saw was a floating charge and that National Westminster Bank could only seek to enforce that species of security. Which meant, of course, that that judgment of Slade in Sibagorm was overruled uh, to some controversy, controversy, as I've uh, mentioned earlier, with particularly Lord Walker's judgment. Uh, if you want to look at some secondary sources that critique the case, have a look at this magnificent edited collection, edited by Getzler and Payne. And of course it comes out of Oxford University Press. It's a great book, involves some very erudite authors, including Professor Sir Roy Good QC and his interesting chapter. But perhaps most interestingly, it's got Gabriel Moss QC's discussions of the case after the House of Lords decision. And that's important because, of course, Gabriel Moss was involved in the case. And it's quite a critical essay that he has submitted to this collection. So have a look at that. Think about Spectrum and its categorizations of fixed and floating charges and the substance of the terms that are used to express a different species of charge. And think about the effect of that House of Lords judgment on lending practice generally in England and Wales. Till our next case, I bid you goodbye.